Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, bloody hell. Start that one again. Good evening, everybody. How are we all doing? I uh, hope you're all good. I hope you can all hear me. And thank you for joining me again on another Tuesday evening. Um, you can see in the background at the moment, apologies if that's going to be a little distracting. I've turned the sound off, but uh, the Leeds game's on. And so um, whilst I can't really see the score and I can't hear it, maybe you might just catch me every so often looking over my shoulder and uh seeing what the score is so yeah apologies there um can everybody hear me can someone just put something in chat just so i know that you can hear me hey there tim hey there mo and mr taco mr taco looking nervous i think perfect thanks everyone for that um right before we uh jump straight in just a sort of a summary of what we're going to try and cover tonight we are going to go through just a little bit of news i'll be honest i'm going to focus a bit on the binance fud um and, and sort of where that's going over the last seven days we're then going to have a look at our research token which is a bit of a favorite of mine most of you are aware uh moonbeam so we're going to go into that i'm going to try and keep the um explanation of that relatively uh one simple and two try not to be totally biased on that but um it is one that I, I do believe in. So we'll go through that. I'm then going to have a chat actually about the whole purpose of the call and the thumbnail is uh, portfolio and risk management. You know, some of us are either gearing up to start building a portfolio or we have started building a portfolio. I just want to sort of go through what I covered about a year ago, sort of re-go over that again and just sort of throw a few other ideas out there, hopefully help some of you along uh, with that. We'll then have a look at uh, BTC and some other uh, token price action. We're coming up to the end of the month. Be interesting to see how the month closes, where we might see price going in March, and where we're looking from a long term and also a short term price basis. So hopefully that'll cover it all. I've got the chat box open. Uh, please dump any questions you've got into the chat box. I had a look on the Google Sheet. There weren't any questions there. And the only question I got asked during the week was about inflationary versus deflationary tokens from greg and i'll cover that in a bit more detail when we go over glimmer without further ado let's just dive in okay um right so we've got btc open at the moment we're going to go over the chart uh, in a little bit there but just having a look at some of the other uh, charts that we've got open we've got the dixie in the bottom left uh, just down here so it's continuing its its climb up. It, it it sort of broke out. I mean, let me just put it on a bigger scale, shall we? Um, might be a bit easier then. What happened? Um, yeah, we we sort of. I don't know. Was it not on the log before? This doesn't look right to me. Um, I'm not sure where my line previously was, but we were somewhere in and around this area. Kind of broken through it. We continue north. Now we had a bit of a red day yesterday. Personally, I just think that was down to both the pound and the euro surging uh, following the news that they'd potentially resolved. I didn't really watch it all. But I think they might have resolved the Northern Ireland issue with the, with the Brexit. Um, and so that, you know, led to both the, the euro and the pound climbing. And given how the Dixie is made up, obviously the dollar suffered from that. So I think that's what caused that drop there. We didn't really see a massive spike in the in the stock markets and the other markets which kind of made me think that it probably was related more to that but it is continuing to climb up there at the moment and you know as long as that continues to climb then the chances are that we're going to see some downward pressure uh on the traditional finance markets which we are still working under the assumption that the cryptocurrency is strongly correlated with those so we do have that to bear in mind so let's get that um and then yeah we've got here uh just the the us 500 and ethereum Kind of just repeat the opposite of what I said about the Dixie. Okay, let's just move into some news. So the first thing I want to talk about is an article that came out yesterday, um, which was uh, published on CoinDesk, but it was actually written by Forbes. It was a Forbes article. And um, effectively, what they talked about is $1.8 billion worth of stablecoin collateral. Um, was moved to a hedge fund last year now let's just be clear straight away it wasn't busd that was being moved it's a it's a 
It's a token called the BPEG USD. So it's Binance's answer to USDC token. So BuzzDC, I don't know what you call it, but the BPEG USDC. Um, what they were saying was this meant that over $1 billion token dollars worth of the token BPEG USDC, a digital replica of the dollar peg stablecoin USDC, were uncatch uh, collateralized despite B Binance's claims that they were 100% back. So if you remember back end of last year, um, when all the FUD was coming out around about FTX and other exchanges and everyone was scrambling to try and verify funds, Binance was always very much a case of, we have always been a one for one peg. We are 100% collateralized, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Forbes has done some digging in on-chain analysis and they believe that $1.8 billion worth um, was actually being moved around. Uh, from other uh, out of these wallets to other um, other wallets, but other other destinations other than Binance. So the cryptocurrency exchange Binance moved 1.8 billion dollars of collateral meant to be back to its customers' stablecoins to hedge funds last year. So I, I actually I'm just going to read the article because I was going to do some commentary on the way down, but I think that might be a little bit biased uh, to start off with. But according to the report, Binance transferred the collateral to hedge funds, including Almeida Research. Cumberland DRW and did so without informing its customers. So there, there is a, a narrative in this that they're, they're effectively they're drawing parallels with with sort of what FTX did, um, and they are also you know alleging that they were going to a hedge fund such as Amida Research, which obviously had such close ties to FTX. Um, and they don't come out and say it necessarily in the article, but what they're effectively talking about there is commingling, so moving funds that's supposed to be allocated and ring fence for for customer holdings. And moving those into more of a hedge fund arm, um, which again was a huge downfall um, of FTX and Alameda Research, and was you know sort of big weight around the neck of a um, one of the biggest problems for their downfall. Uh, the um, blockchain data goes on from August 17 to early December, so effectively over that time period we um, talked about there. Um, examined by forms period, and then comes to the collapse of fellow exchange FTX. About holders of more than a billion of the crypto uh, BPEG USDC. Got to come up with an easier name than that. Had no collateral for instruments that Binance said would be fully backed by the team. They were pegged to BPEG USDC, a digital replica of the dollar peg stablecoin DUSD. This is a difficult article to read. I'm not sure. This guy must have been rushing this one out. Um, so, so, I mean, the article does go on to explain how they came about it, looking through the wallets and what that might mean. I kind of summarized it in that commingling statement. Now, obviously, we have been getting quite a lot of FUD that's been coming around, put around Binance. That's happening for a fair few months now. We actually talked about the relationship between Coindesk and um, DCG, the fact that they're owned of them, the, the ties that they had with FTX, Valmeda Research with Grayscale and all of that kind of debacle and potentially Coindesk uh, you know, favor the Binance FUD. What I will say is that there has been an awful lot of FUD that's come out. Binance has generally um, stood up to the majority of it, has provided um, evidence in inverted commas. Uh, some people don't believe the, the information that's been provided uh, to back up or, or to disprove some of the claims that have been made across the FUD. And this was this was no different. So uh, CZ was very quick to to sort of uh, rebuke this and jump on this, uh, and, and he came out almost immediately afterwards. And we'll go through his Twitter thread in a moment. But effectively, he just claims that Forbes don't know how an exchange works. The co-founder and CEO of Binance, CZ, took to Twitter in response to a FUD article published by Forbes about the exchange and its recent shuffling of funds in the aftermath of the FTX collapse. Forbes published an article focused on the recent shuffling of funds by the cryptocurrency exchange Binance. However, the following day, so today, uh, CZ took to Twitter. They seem not to understand the basics of how an exchange works. Our users are free to withdraw their assets anytime they want. In a series of tweets, he addressed various claims to the form article. Form article. This included a backroom maneuver when Binance transferred 1.8 billion in stable coin collateral to hedge funds such as Tron, Amber Group, Alameda Research, between August and December 2022. I think what we'll do is we will go straight to his tweet and we'll go through line by line. Um, so this, this is what the article is referring to, the top, top one here. I'm reluctantly spending time on FUD again for, in brackets, he puts this a lot. I don't understand what the four means. Any of you know in chat 
what he's talking about when he just puts four in brackets. He does it sometimes as a single tweet or sometimes when he's talking about rebuting Fudd. If anyone knows what that means, please let me know. Drive me crazy. Um, Forbes wrote another Fudd article with lots of accusation, accus, I say it, accusationary ugh, questions with negative spins intentionally misconstruing facts. They referred to some old blockchain transfer transactions that our clients have done. They called out Tron, Amber Group, Alameda Research, etc. They seem to not understand how the basics of an exchange works. Our users are free to withdraw their assets at any time they want. Their withdrawals are turned into receive hundreds of millions of shifted collateral. Our users also must deposit to Binance first to be able to withdraw, which is also easily tra uh, traceable Sorry, on the blockchain. The article conveniently ignores the deposit transaction. The article tries hard to categorize Binance and FTX together including the choice of the article, the title, we are different. I mean, that's been his narrative since, um, since the F FBF, BF, um, spat in November, uh, Binance has stood the test of time with users safely withdrawing billions of dollars in December. I was hanging out socially with crypto friends visiting Dubai every day that week, including, so I'm, sorry, I'm not sure why that's relevant. Uh, we implement proof of reserves using a new zero knowledge approach suggested by Vitalik Buterin, uh, founder of Ethereum, protecting our users' security and privacy. Finance holds user funds one to one, as always. That's what he said for quite a while now. And my Chinese um, ethnicity is brought up again, as if that mattered. I'm deeply disappointed with Forbes continues to write baseless articles, losing their own credibility. Um, yeah, so obviously he's come back and, and tried to, I, I mean, this has kind of been his standard response for most articles, uh, that have been produced, whether or not they're FUD or they're genuine articles, it's always been a, a knee jerk react, but I say knee jerk, fair. a very shut us up, uh, defense of it all. And then what we normally see is over the following sort of hours and days, more evidence to back up those. Um, who do I really believe at the moment? I mean, Forbes have said that they've taken the, the data from on-chain analysis. So, you know. I'm sure the actual raw data is is true, but the fact that they potentially are misconstruing how that uh, how those funds have originally arrived and then moved off uh, the site may um, may suggest that I'd, I'd probably say favoring Binance at the moment, which I never thought I'd uh, say uh, supporting a centralized exchange, but there we are with that. Um, unfortunately, that was not the only bad news for um, Binance in inverted commas uh, this week. As Coinbase announced suspension of the BUSD trading of BUSD token um, for trading beginning March the 13th. So this kind of came out of left field, really. But uh, San Francisco based cryptocurrency exchange referred to its own listing standards as a tweet. We'll go through those in a moment. Um, but it effectively said that they would be suspending trading for the Binance USD stablecoin on March the 13th. Um, the message mentioned its listing standards as being behind the decision. So there was no actual this is what they've done wrong it uh, well let's just scroll down i'll find it for you here we go our determination to suspend trading for busd is based on our own internal monitoring review process when reviewing busd we determined that they no longer met our listing standards and will be suspended um there's a, there's a bit here which actually says what they are i can't find it um but it talks about secure uh security it talks about i can't remember utility and, and there was another one but effectively, it's in their view, it doesn't meet the satisfactory terms of one of those, if not all of them. And so they're going to stop using it. Now, obviously, this came as a bit of a shock. Um, but when you actually look into it a little bit more, perhaps it's not necessarily as bad as, as we lay out. And let's just bring up coin market cap. And I'll try and explain why, if I can find it quickly. BUSD. The, the, the problem really with, uh, well, I say the problem. The reason it's not necessarily as bad as we uh, potentially think is you just got to think about the actual trading volume that's done every 24 hours of BUSD. If we were talking about tens of billions of dollars worth, then that could be a significant problem. But 95% of all BUSD transactions are carried out on Binance. So there's only a very small percentage. I mean, I'm scrolling down at the moment. We still haven't got to where, where Coinbase um, takes part. I'm still scrolling. Here we go. So Coinbase Exchange, this is BUSD, USD. So this is just effectively the swap. And we have, in the last uh, 48 hours, just under $380,000 worth. 
but not much. I'm not going to bother continuing to, to scroll through to find things like BTC and Adam up. But the whole point is that it isn't particularly a huge amount of trading volume that they are stopping. And it's no surprise that demand is probably drying up for uh, the use of BUSD, as we know that there is a ticking clock for um, when Paxos will stop honoring the one-to-one -one exchange agreement that they set up with that. That's currently based on the 24th of February, 2024, so just under a year's time. Um, but as you can see, the news hasn't unpegged. Uh, BUSD still stands at $1, and it's been at $1 um, throughout this entire news article. It's dropped. But, and there is always a but, um, I, I did swap. I mean, I swapped all my BUSD over the weekend. Um, I just, I'm pretty much all in either USDT now or just you playing old USD. Um, and the reason I did is it, this could be just the starting pistol for others. I mean, you can use BUSD on Kraken, on Qcoin. You can use it on a lot of DEXs like PancakeSwap and Uniswap. Um, and it may just be a case that they start to dry up now. Uh, the overall market cap of BUSD is dropping quite uh, drastically. I think it's fallen by nearly 50% over the last 10 months. And it's fallen by about 30% over the last week or two. So, uh, you know, when the Paxos announced it, it was 15 billion. It's now at 10 billion. So, yeah, we've lost 5 billion um, in the last couple of weeks, which, which is crazy. Really. And I just think that as that dries up, uh, fewer and fewer exchanges are going to bother keeping it on the books themselves. So, they can't honor the trading um, option. Now, Coinbase aren't uh, just eradicating the token. You can still store your BUSD on Coinbase. You just can't trade with it. You'd be able to deposit if you really wanted to or withdraw it to another exchange to swap it so it's not a complete hard ban it's just a soft ban on the trading side of things the other reason why i swapped and i'm talking about it in the news thing is finance themselves have said that they're going to come out and just look at the relevancy in inverted commas of, of busd and i just worried that they may announce at a short notice that they're going to get rid of it too and as i said such a vast um, majority of volume is used on Binance, and if they decide that it's not worth them keeping that, is that when we're going to see the bun? So we've got time on our hands now. It's at one dollar. I'm happy to move it to Tether and just keep that on my MetaMask wallet. Uh, and, and so that's that's effectively what I've done. I know we're kind of running out of options, um, and you know we're going to talk about Dai in a moment. It's up to you how you want to keep it or where you want to keep it. But the reality is, you either go back into the market, or you're going to have to find a stable coin to feel comfortable. For me, Tether has had as many deaths written against it as BTC has, and it's still here. So I'm going to keep on using it. Um, so, yeah. Looking um, actually at Dai now, um, this sign posted this article, I posted this article, a few people talked about it in, in the group, and you've probably seen the telegram uh, to suggest that the sign is moving out of Dai. And it all comes from this article here. And effectively, what happened is Oasis, uh, a decentralized finance platform, uh, were ordered by the High Court in England and Wales to effectively use a known hack that they hadn't resolved to exploit their own system and take back the money that was stolen. Now, that's that's all kinds of wrong in all kinds of uh, kinds of ways. But the, the the biggest problem is that. Well, one, they, le they did legally have to comply with the High Court, so they could have stood the ground, we're not going to do it. Well, someone probably would have ended up being arrested. So, unfortunately, yes, they did have to do it. But the fact of the matter is, this was supposed to be a decentralized finance, and they were able to exploit a hack that happened to them to then get some of this money back. And it just sort of threw a cold light on um, how much power this, this decentralized organization had, and actually really considered it very centralized. Um, the reason that Dai got thrown under that is there was um, some link with Dai getting taken back. It was a, it was one of the ones that could be exploited within that. Uh, and Maker Dao, uh, who um, produced Dai, who also involved within that. And I don't know. I didn't really go. You know, I'm not a coder. We're going to see that later on. We talk about Glimmer. Um, so I don't know what this exploit is. I don't know how it works, and I don't know if it's just unique to Oasis or if it can be used anywhere else. But for me, it was just a case of I wasn't in Dai. I was considering moving to it. And I just thought, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to move elsewhere. But again, it strikes another one off the board. And that's, you know, six billion dollars worth of market cap that we not everyone we are ruling ourselves out of using or certainly 
Simez, uh, he's encouraging that himself. So, um, yeah, this was a bit of an interesting one and a bit of a shame that it happened, but sadly, things do. Um, and it looks like Fulham also beating Leeds. So, no, just devastating at the same time. Um, okay, uh, next story. I mean, there's only one left. I found this one particularly amusing. Um, so, this story comes from another story. But uh, effectively, a judge in the United States uh, has ruled that Dapper Labs, uh, they produced a NFT series. Called, I think it was the NBA Hot Shot series. Um, Top Shot series. Top Shot Moments, it was called. Uh, they have a, a case running against them. And, and the high court judge has deemed that this NFT or these NFTs have satisfied being a security. And so the case can go forward. So that was pretty shocking in itself. The NFTs may now also be uh, counted as a uh, security. So we'll watch that one uh, with, with bated breath. I mean, it's a sub story, uh, but in the original story, the judge did say that it has to be done on a case by case basis. And he just deems it in this instance, it does pass the Howie test that they are a security and the case can move forward. What was interesting, though, was deep within uh, his statement uh, was um, he actually deemed that use of emojis could now get you in trouble with the law because it, they are believed to encourage uh, trading, uh, to encourage people to take financial activities. Uh, and in particular, rocket ships, money bags, and charts. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not going to bother going through, through the article, but this judge believes that certain emojis uh, could constitute financial advice. And so if that were to be held up, using them, like of platforms like Twitter, et cetera, or, or YouTube, uh, may land you in, in trouble. I mean, I don't know where it's going to stop. You know, could we use capital letters as well? I don't know. But I love using the rocket and, um, and, the, and the bags of money. Now, interestingly, it was only the chart that went in an upward trend. You know there's a chart that goes in a downward trend as well. That's fine. That's just going to get you wrecked. Um, but, yeah, crazy where, where we stand with some of those. Right, I'll finish the news. Let's just have a look at uh, some of the stuff. A uh, rational biohacker. Bijan, just say, I tried to make you a moderator. Uh, I don't know if it's worked. I think you've got a spanner next to your name now, so that probably does mean you're a moderator, whatever that actually means. Um, anyway, rational biohackers put, uh, isn't too much uh, deflation in an ecosystem a bad thing? Too many people hodling and not actually incentivizing people to use it. If ETH goes to 10K, any transaction will be stupid and expensive. Potentially, yeah. Uh, and we saw what the transaction... Um, the transactions were like in the last bull run. You know, it was crazy. Uh, I remember buying six hundred dollars worth of some crap token on a decentralized exchange. It cost me four hundred dollars in, in gas fees. Um, BSD volume on Coinbase is very low, two hundred k a day. Uh, there you go. I mean, we saw there even swapping it. People trying to get rid of BUSD is only three hundred grand a day. So, uh, what about the rocket emoji in a downward? Di is there a rocket emoji in a downward direction? If there is, I need to use that one. Uh, so pudgy penguins can now be classed as a security on a penguin to penguin basis, essentially. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we could start all day with, uh, with this and yes, you do have a spanner now. So thank you for that. Uh, Abib, I didn't know what, you, if you're even here, but I didn't know what your actual name was to make you, um, moderator as well. I suppose it now gives you the power to ban people. Not that we have that raucous crowd. Um, yeah, so that's it with the news. Um, what we'll do now is we will jump into talking about Glimmer. Minimize this. Or sorry, talking about Moonbeam. I've got to get that right. This is brilliant. Moonbeam. Okay. Um, Moonbeam. I've, as always, got some notes on the screen. I will post these through. They're really jumbled up because my mind is just working at about 100 miles an hour in terms of what I wanted to try and get down. So I'll tidy them up and I will I'll put them out. So if you see me looking over here, it's just because I'm referring to my notes as well as everything else. But I think most people uh, in the community know that I am a big fan of the uh, Polkadot ecosystem. I'm a big holder of Dot. I was a big holder of Dot in the last ball run. I plan to be uh, in this one. Um, the difference between the last ball run and this ball run is now the parachains are up and running. And so we've got an ecosystem in which we can also invest in. And the parachains effectively started um, back in the 2021. 
And why the height of the bull market? Um, and what, although we'll go into it, Moonbeam won the second parachain auction, uh, which was sort of end of November um, 2021. And that effectively gives it permission to lease, in inverted commas, access to the relay chain. The relay chain is what the Polkadot ecosystem is effectively built off for a period of two years. They can extend it if they want to, and I'm sure they will. But effectively, access for two years to build out their, their product, their project, uh, and then effectively run it. And I'm not going to bother going into how the parachains worked or, or sort of the auction or, or whatever. All I'll say is that typically, because um, it is relevant to when we talk about tokenomics, uh, you get access to the parachain for 104 weeks, so effectively two years. As I say, you can renew it. Um, they were done on crowd loans. So um, what would happen is you got um, a couple of projects that would bid for each of the, um, the parachain slots in the auction. It was done by a, um, I don't know what they call it, like a, a candle auction. So effectively the auction ran for a week. You didn't know, but at some point the candle was extinguished. It was based on a 17th century English um, way of carrying out auctions. They just let a candle burn itself out. Um, and when it did, the auction ended. What it does, it discourages people from waiting to the end and just like spam bidding. You have to get your bids in. And then whenever that time went out, you didn't know about it till after the seven days, but then go retrospectively go back and go, oh, by the way, it finished on day four. Who was the highest bidder at day four? You're the one that won it. Even if you put in a higher bid after that, it didn't matter. They believe it's fairer. doesn't really matter. That's how it went about. Um, but they would go around getting support for their project. And Moonbeam was a very popular one. It was you know, a shoe in to absolutely win. It had a huge support for it. And I was really geared up um, to, to put some funds into uh, the Moonbeam um, parachain. I didn't in the end. And thank God that I didn't. We didn't know it was going to be the end of the bull run at the time. But uh, Dot was at about $50 a time. And it was alleged originally that the return was going to be, for every Dot invested, you'd get 150 glimmer back, which sounded very appealing. However, when you got closer and closer to time, it was one and five. And I just thought, I'm not locking up my funds for two years for just five glimmer. So I didn't, and I sold all my Dot. And it was a very handsome trade that I made. I foolishly put most of that back into something else later on because I didn't know it was the end of the bull run. But um, you know, I'm glad that I didn't lock it up given where Dot is now and also where Moonbeam is. Anyway, so as I said, Moonbeam came about, and let me try and find the actual dates. Uh, I didn't put it down. Oh yeah, I did. Uh, oh, it just says end. Yeah, won the second parachain, the end of November, 2021. And it the crowd loan raised effectively $1 billion worth of Dot was, was locked up uh, for the community uh, to use. So what does Moonbeam do and why effectively do I like it? Okay, so, so Moonbeam is a, is a blockchain protocol. Uh, it's designed to effectively be fully compatible with the likes of the Ethereum ecosystem. I'll kind of break down how that works a little bit later on. Um, but as someone just put in one of the comments, uh, you know, Ethereum, it's a very expensive ecosystem. Uh, it's very expensive to uh, transact upon. And so the fact that Moonbeam can offer complete interoperability, uh, versatility, and just a, a, a quick, you know, cut, copy, and paste over onto the Moonbeam without having to change any of the uh, the coding uh, or the programming from whatever you're bringing over, the fees are considerably less. And so that's one of the main attractions, I suppose, for it, and one of the things why they think they'll get some usability uh, from that. Um, anyway. It is, it was set up and it is run by a company called Pure Stake. The CEO of that is a guy called Derek Yu. Um, I'm just jumping about a bit here, but um, so this is Pure Stake, uh, elevated in blockchain. They don't just do uh, Moon River. They have a history of um, building out um, networks and protocols and blockchain technology. Um, here is the team. I'm not going to bother going through the full team. Um, you can have a look on the website yourself. Uh, they are based out of Boston, um, and obviously that's very close to MIT. I am not saying that that is a, an advantage or necessarily a disadvantage, but it does seem like a lot of the engineers and software engineers come from MIT. The reputation I understand of MIT is a very good school, and so hopefully they're getting a good caliber of people working within it. Um, as I say, Derek has been with the company since the beginning. He has a decent amount of history in other 
uh, blockchain related companies and yeah he's, he's suitable for the part messages up um, and then you can have a look at your stake as well I just had a look apparently there's 32 employees registered on LinkedIn currently work there at the moment however the data is only back to the middle of 2022 so we don't know where that really sits at the moment um, but going back to, to, to Moonbeam itself so I, I wrote some notes down here uh, thinking I was being really clever with what it does um and i think i've really gone and uh, confused myself by writing it but i'm going to read what i wrote and then we'll go from there but moonbeam's main aim is to create that interoperable blockchain ecosystem based on um how can I... uh cross chain uh yeah cross chain and, and interoperability kind of features and applications uh that work effectively in Effectively in unison, the work in unison uh, to deliver uh, solutions for. I know. I mean, they've got. We'll have a look at the moment. But DeFi, they've got Dexes, NFTs, Explorers, uh, wallets, all sorts. So um, they've got about a hundred protocols, hundred plus protocols on it at the moment. It is still growing. Um, I've put plenty of charts. Bijan's done a few uh, himself. With sort of the de uh, developer activity on both the Moonbeam and the Kusama. Uh, or Moon River Network, um, but it. This is where I, I wrote the actual notes because there were so many different things here. But effectively, these hundred plus protocols integrate bridges, oracles, DApps, DeFi components, explorers, storage providers, and Web three wallets, all with the access to and communication with the various ecosystems linked with Moonbeam. And, and when we talk about ecosystems linked with Moonbeam. Yes, obviously, we're talking about Polkadot. We're also talking about Ethereum, but we're talking about Solana. We're talking about uh, even Bitcoin. Um, so it's it's very adaptable. And I often think of it as, um, if you're a Trekkie out there, the universal translator. So, I mean, it doesn't work for absolutely everything, but generally you plug in what you think is gobbledygook data, it will turn it into something that can then work on Ethereum compatible smart contracts. Um, and it uses this thing called an EVM, which is, we talked about last week with Near Protocol, uh, the Ethereum virtual machines. Um, I'm going to try and get into a bit of the techie side now. I don't understand this because I am just not, not coded minded. Um, so let me just find where I wrote the notes on it. And then we can go from there. Where did I write the notes? Okay, so apparently it's built um, off the substrate framework using Rust as a as a coding tool i i, I presume i'd say it doesn't mean, mean much to me but a lot of people seem to think it's a, a, a big positivity and provides that versatility that we were talking about uh, this actually makes it compatible with the evms that i mentioned so um as virtual machines we talked about um and for anyone that uses solidity again i i, I presume that's some form of coding or programming apologies for any coders or programmers in there that know what i'm uh, talking about um so the compatibility with the evm allows ethereum based functionality on the polka dot system i'm going to kind of go through the website in a moment I'm just jumping through all my notes um it provides that's it this streamlined process for the developers so if they want to redeploy those programs or those contracts that we talked about whether that be through solidity um uh, whether it be through the uh, the evms um it can do that on the network you can just effectively plug and go um have a look okay let's have a look at the website um so i i actually kind of like the website uh it has been improved over the last year which is good to see and we'll have a look at what the app looks like as well a little bit later on but it's pretty clean in terms of what you want to do everything's in i mean I'm, you know, who cares about the coloring it's not really for me but it's everything stands out it's clean it's not a too overcrowded you do get into the documentation a little bit later on which makes it quite overcrowded um and it just goes through uh what it is i think the different sectors are labeled quite well. Um, so at the moment we're in the builders and this is now talking about, this is where I got some of the information from, you know, how you can become a builder, how you can start uh, developing products on there. So we talked about that cross chain connected applications uh, for blockchains like Ethereum, Cosmos, Avalanche, Polkadot. Um, it is proof of stake and it's built on that substrate, which I mentioned. Someone in here is going to know far more about that than, than I do. 
Um, if you're into that kind of stuff, this just goes into a lot of the detail about how you can do it. And there's an application process that you can go through and blah, blah, blah. Um, into the documentation itself. So um, it's, it's pretty just click and go. Um, there's obviously sections down here. If you want to do a bit more focus on the builders, you can just go through what it is. So the, the cross chain interoperability, talk about the XC20s, which is effectively how anything that's on the Polkadot ports to an ERC20 token. For those of you that are not particularly aware of what an ERC20 token is, but you've heard of it, they're, they're ones that are built off the Ethereum blockchain, ERC20. Um, there is an ERC721. Someone might correct me on that um, as well. So, yep, yeah, so you can go through that, talk about nodes, how you run a nose, how you become a validator or a collator, um, kind of stuff. Tokens, we're going to go into the tokenomics a little bit later, but this is more about what the token is, how it works, and what you can do with it. Um, so, yeah, so the document side of thing, this is where the more of the detail is. We're going back onto the actual website. Um, in the community, you can have a look at the projects that it's in. I'm just going to scroll to the top and then we'll sort of work our way down. I'll talk about the difference between Moonbeam and Moon River in a moment. Um, but, you know, some of these you may not know, some of them you will, some of them are not actually um, crypto projects that the underlying company that is, is building off those. But there are some in here that you've probably heard of. Asta's another, um, another Polkadot parachain. Uh, so it's Fala, that's for sort of cloud storage. Um, Osmosis is a decentralized exchange. Have a look at the Fearless is a wallet. Um, Bean swapped another exchange. I'm just scrolling, trying to find some big names now. Curve Finance is on there. Um, let's have a look if there's anything else. Beefy Finance, some of us might have used that in the uh, DAO days, in the DeFi days. Ethereum Scan, obviously, you can have a look and follow transactions on there. Um, the, the wallets are all on here. I don't know where they are. But they're somewhere in here. But as you can see, there's an awful lot. Metamask is there. Chainlink is there. Equilibrium is there. Right, it's starting to get to one. Band is there. So, yeah, starting to get the ones that we, we know. Just... Okay. Um... But then there's also uh, sort of the DeFi ecosystem that we've got here. And this sort of probably, they're all the same, but it puts it under the hats that you can see. So you can actually see that this is being developed upon. There are um, protocols and projects that are out there that are working. Uh, and that's what you want to see. This is only a year old. And we've already got all of these partnerships, these relationships, and these products being built off that. And they're, they're covering, you know, sectors which were one big 12 months ago, but, you know, are, are certainly going to be big going forward. And I think, you know, one of the ones that's really going to lead the charge in the next bull one is going to be DeFi. With regulation coming with the lack of trust in centralized exchanges and CeFi, DeFi is going to be a really big area. And this is by no means a, a large um, representation of DeFi, but it's good to see that they have already started developing that and, and how that's going to come out. So, again, you know, I'm very positive about what me, Moonbeam is going to do. But for the vast majority of you, you don't really actually care about Moonbeam. What you care about is the tokenomics and the price of its token and what that token actually is. And so we'll have a look at that. So Moonbeam has a token. And its token is called Glimmer or represented as GLMR. Um, so that is the utility token, as I said here, from the Moonbeam network. I always get really nervous when someone talks about a utility token because every crypto seems to have a utility token and nine times out of ten. They don't need one. Um, so what does this token do? Why is it a little bit different? So um, well, let's go down. Uh, so it allows for on-chain governance. So there is kind of like that DAO side of things. Um, it is proof of stake, but there is some decent, well, there is decent. I've got to be careful what I say here. Some people feel that it is centralized because obviously so much of it is locked up. But actually, um, by locking up your tokens, you get voting rights. And depending on how many tokens you have, depends on, uh, how big a voting right you have. It's a bit like how it was back in the DAO days. So yeah, for on-chain um, governance, for network transactions, uh, which is important for gas metering and 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 for the uh, security. So it's not just uh, for, for transactions, which is which is good to see. Um, although we know that we've got a vibrant ecosystem. So, you know, this is the most important one, having a token that is doing the transactions. Just going back up to, to where it is here. So the Genesis token supply, so the original total um, 
token supply was 1 billion tokens. However, it has an annual inflation rate of 5%. And when we go and have a look at the tokenomics in a moment, where we can see that we've already moved across from that. But there is a burn mechanism within that. And so that gives it the capability of becoming deflationary. Say, gives it the capability of becoming deflationary. So every time a transaction is ha happens, uh, a fee is paid. Of that fee, 80% of that is burnt. Uh, and then 20% goes to the treasury uh, and they use that however they, they need to use that. The only way that this will become deflationary is if the um, amount of transactions is greater than, well, it's actually, if it's a 5% increase, it's going to have to be 6% great because it's only 80% of it gets burned. So it's greater than 6% um, of the uh, inflation rate. So they've got some work to do. Uh, on that, but it is a relatively new project. Um, this is not unusual to see one, that, that amount of uncapped inflation, but also this mechanism. But there is potential for it to be deflationary, which is good. That's what we want to see. Uh, it, it says anticipated launch. It did launch in January 2022, I think. It might be February 2022. We'll have a look at all-time highs and everything else a little bit later on. Um, this is where we talk about the, the allocation of the tokens. And whilst I like how um, transparent this has been, it actually is a little bit worrying as well and potentially one of the negatives that we need to think about. Um, so all 1 billion tokens have been allocated and they have been broken up in this pie charts here. And now it's just a case of the speed in which they get released. And you can see some large percentage, you know, seed funding, 14%, strategic funding, 12%, take flight uh, community events. So they were like, again, people who were right back at the beginning of it. So probably members of the team, nearly 10%. The crowd loan itself got 15%. We know that they're locked up for 196 weeks. So um, just with that, uh, when you, when Moonbeam or any um, project won a, a power chain, 30% of whatever tokens you were going to get, you got issued immediately. And the remaining 70% were locked up for 96 weeks. So 30% were dumped on the market immediately. And the remaining 70% of that 150 million will be released around about October this year. So that's something that we need to bear in mind. We've got the, uh, the bond funding um, reserve. We've got the treasury, which feels like it's a bit of a team. Long-term protocol and ecosystem development. That's going to be held by the team. It's the long-term management of it. Um, and then we've got key partners and advisors. The whole point I'm trying to say is that it does feel like you could have actually just broken this down into those that supported the crowd like, and those that were part of the team. Um, and then when you look at the vesting schedules, yes, they've all pretty much end after two years, which is great, but they started from within the first two months of it launching. So they were quite quick at trying to get rid of these tokens, which initially sucks if you held the token. And, and I'll be honest, I was buying to start off with. Um, so, you know, we, we'll have a look at the price in a moment, what that did to it. But I was, you know, buying tokens were getting unlocked at a very regular basis, putting more um, supply on the market. If it wasn't the demand for that, you can imagine what happened to the price. And especially in a bear market, that's exactly what did happen. So it's great that they've been transparent but it still feels like an awful lot was originally held by team members. Um, but we're going to have a look at where that currently sits now. I've used this website a few times. Uh, it's called Token Unlocks. I've posted it in the group. I'll post it in again. But this, uh, it, well, let's just, let's just uh, duplicate that. Um, so this is what it looks like originally. So it just lists all the tokens and then it gives like the ones that are closest to unlocks. And you can just click on all of them and it'll tell you, but it gives a little countdown. So we know that Ulia has another token unlock of 0.4% or eight, nearly $900,000 worth in two hours time. And you can just go through. You can see that Moonbeam has another unlock in 10 days. It's approximately 1% or four, um, four $4.2 million worth. So obviously it's got a market cap at the moment of about $420 million. So, you know, that could, again, if there's no demand for buying it up, could cause uh, the price. Sorry, the um, price to uh, to continue to pull. But if we go back into the the glimmer token, there's a few things that I want you to to have a look at here. So total locked up, there's actually only twenty five percent, twenty six percent of the uh, total locked up value still remaining to go. So they have actually done an awful lot of the unlock, uh, or what will be unlocked um, already, which is good. 
because we or vast majority of you may not um have invested in this yet and so it's had a, the majority of the downward pressure already and price is significantly suppressed that's good to see um as i say uh it unlocks in 10 days i want to have a look at this vesting schedule whenever i put my cursor over it though that happens so it's pretty annoying um so what we'll do is we'll have a look at this one which isn't great but this gives you a bit of a visual representation of all of those token unlocks every time this steps up is more tokens being hit onto the market and we currently stand at just under 600 um million out of the 1 billion which actually doesn't tie in with what um because that would say that we're about only 60 percent well, this is saying we're at 76 has been unlocked so there's a bit of disparity there but we do have a circulating supply of just under 600 million so we will go with around about 60 percent but what you can see and i will just hold it over just briefly so i can see but come the 15th of october 2023 so this year we will have unlocked 90 percent of all tokens and then after that, we're, we're effectively in the realms of just the inflationary rate. And so that, that worry that I had that the vast majority of the team held a lot of the tokens, well, they did. And they are dumping them quickly onto the market. But we're not bag holders. We didn't actually get involved in the parachains. We were buying these at $50 a dot to only get five back, effectively working out at what? $10 a, uh, a Moonbeam, you know. It's under 20, a 20th of that at the moment. Um, we don't know where the price is going to go uh, this year. But it does present us with a good opportunity for anyone that wants to get in in the next bull run to get um, a very good price with, with not that much of the token supply still left to be dropped on us. Um, and so that, that is a positive thing. It's already out there. People are owning it. Now, a lot of it is getting locked up in state, and a lot of that 5% that is um, produced each year does go for stake and rewards. So. There is still that dilution. What we need to see is uh, the ecosystem picking up, the network transactions happening, and the burn rate increasing. Um, why do I say that? Well, if we go to Moonbeam at the moment, it's been around for a year. So it's not no longer a billion. It's had one round of 5% because it was a billion. We knew that was going to be 50 million. Um, 50 million's worth of... Actually, it's just been just over a year, to be fair. 50 million new tokens well we're at 46 so we've burned roughly four or five million of that in transaction fee so about 10 where we need to be so there's definitely room to move but at least we are burning some we just haven't taken it to a deflationary level yet um what else do i want to say about moonbeam uh oh yeah let's have a look at the actual um let's just get it on the copper chart shall we? Okay, let's get this on the three day chart time frame. So, Glimmer was effectively conceived and then um, born in the bear market. And so, all it's known is a bear market. And we have seen that suppression of the price as a token released and just interest in, in cryptos in general waver quite significantly. Now, on the day of launch, it at some stage got up to $50. I mean, people were just probably just dumping their tokens um, as quick as they can. So I kind of ignore that. I'm not really interested in that spike up there. I kind of take its price from around about April time. Um, and so I'm going to use it 5%, $5 as its, its all-time high. Now, it's, it's fallen significantly from then. And again, we're less than a tenth of that price now. But with the rest of the crypto market what we have seen to be fair to it is a break around about a similar time um to, to everything else beginning of the year it, after that double bottom and it started to form and we i mean we're going to go into this in detail if i drop it onto the daily chart you know we can say there is a break well there's not actually then no, we can't say that it's not done the same we started to potentially form lower high sorry higher lows and higher highs what we need is although this spiked above it, it didn't close above it. So we really need to see this next leg up take out the November FTX. And then we might be convinced it's coming. Unfortunately, timing is against it. We know that we've got um, another 900,000 tokens effectively getting dumped um, onto the market um, in 10 days' time. So, you know, that could then just cause the price to go down. 
I have been buying this recently. I've been buying it for probably the last month now, and I held a decent amount of it. I split it over about three wallets just because I stake it all, and I don't want to stake it all with one particular collator. Um, but this is what the wallet looks like, and it's it just is a fairly simple wallet, really. So I, I've got in this wallet about seven and a quarter thousand glimmer. Um, that's stake, so it's no longer sat in my wallet. The remainder I've got in my wallet is just to cover fees. It's down here, and then the stake and rewards. You know, they they basically come out four times a day, and they just tell you how much it is around there. When I first started taking this last year, I was getting about thirty three percent. I'm getting about eleven percent now, and that's just going to gradually decrease over time. Um, that's just the way it is. But I'm quite happy with the amount that I've got, just just sitting there, just getting the stake and rewards on that. I, I imagine I'll be holding this now for you know. 12, 18, 24 months. So I'm just going to let the, that, you know, compound up uh, within that. But this is what the, the app looks like. If you want to get to it, um, I lost it now. Where is it? There we go. Yeah, you just go to launch app and you connect your MetaMask wallet or whatever it is, and then you go from there. Uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of it for, for Moomoo. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not it at all. Apologies. Um, let's have a look. Just trying to see markets that it's available on. It's available just about everywhere. Um, Binance, KuCoin, Kraken, OKX, Gate, Herobe, uh, Crypto.com. So yeah, it's 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 widely available uh, in a lot of the big ones. Got a decent amount of volume, about ten ten million dollars worth of volume. I've never had a problem getting an order filled. I just use Binance uh, for mine. Um. So we'll look, we've gone through resting periods. It's ranked 145 on CMC. That might have changed. That's no, still 145. Uh, socials. So it's got a very active social community. Um, if we just go back onto here, Twitter, I think it's got about 300,000 followers on, on, on Twitter. Uh, yeah, 287,000 followers on Twitter. It's got a Discord. It's on Discord, it's probably got about 12,000 in there, some really useful information. It's very interactive. There's a lot of uh, good stuff that comes from this. These guys are posting a lot. It's very much about what's going on, new projects, how projects are developing. It's, it's you know, if you're into it, it's an interesting um, one. You can see that I do follow it. Um, right. Uh, so benefits. Uh, I mean, I've kind of covered a lot of them, that com uh, compatibility, the scalability, the lower transaction fees in Ethereum, that interoperability. And the fact that it actually does have a very active um, developing community within that, all positive things to see. In terms of potential some drawbacks, um, will we really see the demand for it? I mean, yeah, it's great to see that there's 100 projects on there, but we looked at NIR protocol last week, there were 1,000 on that one. So, you know, we've got it. That NIR has been around a lot longer. Um, so we've got to give Moonbeam the benefit of the doubt there, but we've got to really see that uptick, uptake uh, of use from that and that's what i want to see but to get that real uh, potential growth it is in my opinion is going to be very tied to the success of polka dot so if anything bad comes about from polka dot whatever that may be whether it be the product team whatever that's probably going to have a very negative impact on moonbeam as the relationship between them is very intertwined the token on which we kind of talked about the team did hold an awful lot of that causing that downward pressure we've still got another year of that um significant amount of tokens uh to be released you know what 300 million tokens 30 percent of the tokens still need to be released in the next 10 months so that's quite a bit and that could despite any bull sentiment could still drive that price down there so you just gotta be careful about yoloing in uh, and just thinking about key levels to buy and then one thing that kept up coming up a couple of times and again i don't really understand it but um because of the uh, the coding that they use, whether that be the, the substrate framework, I'm not necessarily sure it's the Rust, but it's that solidity um, that they use. A lot of Ethereum DeFi projects that have been hacked have been built on the same systems or coding or programming, whatever it is. And so is there a risk that some of these could also be hacked? I don't know, but that, that's one thing that people are suggesting. However, they've made their bed and lied in what they're building it on. So that's now not going to change. Um, so that's just something that if that is going to be the case, that Moonbeam and, and the individual projects you have to work to, to try and counter. But for me, um, I'm not all in on it, but I am heavily in on it. I will continue to buy regardless of where it is. 
Um, where do I see it going? Um, I mean, even back to my all time highs of $5, you know, which is a 10 X from here, that's going to need to be about what, where are we? Where have I lost? So we've got, so it's market cap 250. So 10 X fear would be 2.5 billion in terms of where we are with the current circulating supply. Let's just assume we're at max circulating supply. Um, that's going to actually be around about 5 billion um for that to, to to be the case that's not necessarily unheard of um particularly if we are going to get to sort of that three trillion overall market cap size um but yeah i, I can i can personally um see it doing that um let's just say in the next bull run some of you may be looking for much bigger gains but i'd be quite happy with sort of my 13x you know 12 13x so that would be from this current price um and yeah i'm going to go through some of the questions and just Make sure that I've not missed anything. I've not bored everybody to death. Um, where am I? Moon River has a hellish bearish market. Okay, so I didn't talk about Moon River. Moon River is effectively exactly the same as Moonbeam. It runs on the Kusama network. For those of you who aren't aware, the Kusama network is effectively like the cousin of Polkadot network where you can dummy run um, your projects. Uh, make sure you iron out as many of the kinks as you can before releasing it on the Polkadot network. It's exactly the same with how Moon River um runs obviously it was launched earlier and it didn't have a parachain auction as such but you're right it did get dumped on i think everyone got very excited uh with moon river overly excited i mean it's like 400 dollars at one stage um and yeah look at it now it's at 10 dollars. so yeah well over 400 um but it, it lived through you know the the hype cycle um of the market i mean this this actually looks like a great coin to, to get in now. Look at it flat line like that. Whether it's, you know, $6 or $9, I don't think we're going to see those heights again by any uh, stretch of the imagination. It does have a low total supply, though. There's only 10 million of them. Um, I personally haven't really gone into Moon River. I've just focused on, on, on Moon Beam. Um, but people can use Moon River to, and it is incentivized. You still get sort of like paid to use it uh, in inverted commas. So, you know, it's not like people are, I'm not going to bother wasting my time. They get an opportunity to try it there. Like I say, iron out the bugs, move it across. It's just, I suppose, where it sits with the roadmap. Um, uh, Astra is one of the most popular alts in Japan. Yep, yeah, I think that one, the, was it Akala or Astra won the first parachain? I can't actually. Yeah, I, don't know. I thought I had the list of um oh here we go, list of all power chains. There is um so the Carlo got the first on the eighteenth, Moonbeam also on the eighteenth, Aster on the eighteenth, and Power and uh, Clover. So they run the first five, then they did another five, another five. It's on coin market cap, you can have a look at where they are. Um with those. But yep, yeah, Aster. I mean Aster and Farlo are on our Chinese watch list or my Chinese watch list as well. So interesting to see there. Uh, isn't this a problem with all power chains launching projects? So those who submit uh, the most dot just end up uh, dumping their token allocation on the retail. Well, they will do, yeah. When it, I'm sure. I mean, the problem is, is a lot of people, you know, locked up their dot when it was fifty. You start to see some life in it. Are they really going to sell it at thirty if we get a bit of a run um, and take that hit? You know, you'd like to think that the people who locked up their dot believed in that, believed in poker dot. That's why they bought it. But you're right. There's, that's that's the risk. Um, so yeah, needs to be thought about there. Clover Finance, another power chain winner. Yep. Uh Imazario Glimmer is ranked number two in interoperability, second to QNT. I didn't go over um the uh competitors. I'm not gonna bother going through it now because I'm just conscious of time. But yeah. Uh Simon's strategy last bull one was just to buy the top two tokens of each set on Mazari. I'm gonna go over why that might not be the best option for for some people in a moment. Um uh, Harry, do you know? Uh, if ideas ICOs are still being offered, is there somewhere to see which project are uh, fundraising for a launch? I don't know um, if there's a particular website that necessarily says that. I mean, we had IEOs, initial exchange offerings. That seemed to be a, a more recent thing in, in bull runs. I know that um, Bybit and Binance used to run a lot of those. So I, I don't know, but Greg, I'll have a look for you. Market cap of uh, 255 mil compared to Quant's only got 1.5 million market cap. That can't be right. Can it? Do you mean billion? Can't be right. Uh, one point five billion. He did mean billion. Uh, 
if something good uh, builds on Moomoo, then demand for the token will rise akin to what we saw in Phantom and Avax. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, some people have had issues on Glimmer staking, but not been getting their rewards. I've not had an issue now. That is down to your collator. And I did a video on, um, on how to stake on Glimmer, and I was quite clear on that. You need to do your research on your collator. So if you are interested in staking, go on to Vimo. I rewatched that video recently to remember how to stake. It's still completely valid. Do your research on your collator. You can go onto the Moonbeam. I think it's the Moonbeam Discord. You can actually speak to the collators, ask them any questions that you want, find one that you're comfortable with. If there is bad apples, they do get penalized if they're not passing on the rewards, if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. But okay. Uh, five bill is perfectly achievable if uh, BTC moons to 100K, especially for something ranked in the tuning sector. Yep. Yep. Okay. So that's my very quick rundown of Glimmer. I, I kind of think it's a bit messy. I actually might do a video on Glimmer this week just because everything's there. I've got the notes and think. I might just do like a five minute video on it, put some graphics behind, etc. Uh, and then just post it in the group. It is one that I really like. So uh, stand by for that one. I'll try and get it out on Friday. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I've got nothing on. So I will do it tomorrow. Trying to edit over the next couple of days. Um, okay. Let me just minimize that. I right, just need to grab a drink. The floor is still warm. Okay. Right. I want to talk about portfolio and risk management, including profit taking. So this is something that I spoke about a year ago in what I did during the last bull run. And that's why I asked the question in um in the chat as to can I let's just end poll so I can see the results. Um can't see my red poll now. Okay. Um, that's why I asked the question to see whether or not this is your first pool, whenever it starts, the first pool market. Sorry, just let me blow my nose. Release this. Very attractive there. Um, anyway, um, I watch a lot of YouTube videos, and someone that I was watching, they went over talking about their portfolio and risk management and it reminded me of what I did and I actually thought now is an ideal time to start talking about that again because we you know we joke about this I say we joke about it. we talk about this I don't think people take it seriously you know you need to have a plan you know if, if you're just going to go in and just I'm just going to buy a smattering of whatever not have any idea about when you're going to take profit what they even are why are you going to do it how are you going to balance it you're going to end up losing money and and that's a hard thing to say, but the realities are, and the statistics are there, you know, 75, 85% of everybody who trades loses money. You know, we'd like to think that in our group, we've got a collective bit of alpha to maybe reduce that number slightly, but we ain't going to be eradicated. So you just got to be, and I said this a year ago, and I'll say it again now, and I'll keep on saying it. You have got to take that responsibility yourself to understand why you are in it, how you are going to manage it. And at some stage, I know Simon is going to, you know, he'll start having a look. At what he wants to do with his portfolio, getting back in, looking at it in a bit more detail, whether or not he does what he did last time or something completely different. Try and have an understanding of what you want. And then when he starts talking about what he's going to do, see if that marries in with what you, you like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what I did, how it works. I'm going to try and give a few examples of how others can do stuff. And then the other thing I want to talk about is profit taking. And we really need to talk about profit taking. You need to get into a position where you're not afraid to take profits. I did take profits in the bull run. I don't, I looking back, I definitely didn't take as much as I should have done, but it's a step stone. You know, first bull market I was in, I didn't take any profits. Last one I was in, I did take profits and I felt relatively comfortable. I didn't take enough. And that is something that I'm going to work on going forward into the next one. So understanding a system that you can use to, to help you take take some profits okay so what i did and for those of you who have been in the group for a bit longer than a year you'll remember me talking about a three pot system i did a video on it and the video is on vimo you can have a look at it here actually it's only had 53 views uh the first half of the video i would say the first half the first couple of minutes is sign going through his crypto portfolio i would ignore that i only say i ignore that because i don't know that he's going to go uh, through with that again so skip forward about two minutes the rest of the video is only about five minutes long and i just go through the three pots i'm not going to play the video for you that i effectively use and how i moved assets from one pot to another 
to, to effectively build a bag. Um, and the three pots that I, that I had, I'll leave this on the screen at the moment. Um, I, I had my safe pot, my blue chip alt pot, and my, my gambling pot. So the safe pot was BTC and Ethereum. That's all was in it. Um, and I never touched it throughout the entire bull run. I just, you know, that was just what was there. I kind of treated it as a savings or a pension fund, effectively. So that only had two, two assets in it. My uh, next pot, my blue chip pot, now that started off originally with about five assets in it. Uh, it grew over, over the period, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But effectively, these were medium-term holds. These are ones that I had, I had belief in, but ultimately, you know, even Dot sat in this pot at the time. I knew I was going to take profits on it. They were just a stepping stone to get me more BTC and more Ethereum. And so when they got to a certain level, I would sell. I'd either take profits into cash or I'd convert it into BTC and Ethereum, um, and I'd move it into pot one. And then there was pot three. And pot three is where I spent the majority of my day-to-day -day, uh, activities. And this was my gambling pot, my small cap alt pot. It wasn't my trading pot. It wasn't my derivatives trading pot. I didn't really do that during the last bull run. Um, I did it during the bear market. So, yeah, more for me. Um, but this was short-term holds, tokens that I have absolutely no care in the world about, but I just even have heard about them. I think they've been got some TA, which might suggest that they're going to pop in a moment, whatever it is, and I would move into that. And I would try and get in and out of those as quickly as I possibly could. And again, all I was doing was at least taking my um, the funds that I put in, drawing that out, moving that into my blue chip pot, so buying more of the blue chips with effectively free money, waiting for that to continue to go up and then moving it across the BTC. And that worked incredibly well. And I was able to take a relatively small amount of money. Granted, I was able to buy at a very good time, very low, and a lot earlier than most people in the RT group. Um, but I was able to take a very small amount of money and grow that exponentially over 18 months, 24 months. And all it was was just moving money, uh, sorry, moving, yeah, moving money from different pots and just being very disciplined uh, with how I did it. Now, you don't have to have three pots. You don't have to, you can have 10, you can have two, you can have, well, if you have one, you've just got a portfolio. Um, however you decide to do it. But it's just about having a bit of structure and a bit of rules as to what they are. Now, before we sort of go through some examples, it did fall down for me and I'll, I'll explain where my issue became. Um, what I found was by the end of the bull run, I probably had over 90 assets, nine zero assets. Um, that was very, one, difficult to manage in terms of where they all were, because they weren't all on centralized exchange, and they were all in different wallets, et cetera. Uh, and two, it cost me a lot of money, particularly when I was dealing with DeFi in gas fees. And I didn't realize how much it cost me in gas fees until I went into um, doing my tax returns, and it sort of listed out the amount I paid for gas. And I wasted a considerable amount. I mean, tens of thousands, I would suggest, in do dollars in just gas fees alone. And so, it, you know, I thought I had done a lot better than I actually had. But, you know, the cold, hard facts of where the figures were, assuming that the tax calculation was correct, suggested I actually spent a lot more in gas, which, you know, ate in significantly into my profits. It is what it is. But, you know, going forward, I want to adapt that. So how am i going to do this differently well you you've probably seen on my watch list um i have a portfolio watch list here and this is this is fair you know long term hold you can pretty much read as pot one I, I don't know if dot's going to sit in there if i'm honest i'm trying not to be married to dot i love it i think it's going to do really well for me but i will be taking profits from it so it, it kind of you know my heart tells me it's a long term one but my head's trying to tell me it still should stay in the medium terms Medium terms are my pot twos. And so this at the moment is where my pot two is going to be. I'm going to have a look at BNB. I talked about OKB, the exchange token of OKX. I might use that one instead. And so if that's the case, it will either add to that or it will go. But you can kind of see that we're only talking about 10 tokens there. And then the shit coins. So, I mean, we can... Six of these coins are actually only three because it's gas BTC and gas BUSD and on BTC and on USD. These are just the spiky fade trades. So they're not ones that I'm particularly holding. I'm just trying to build some more BTC. Um, Swissborg, I just hold a lot of their tokens for the last bull run. So I don't have it. Doge, I will buy $5,000 worth of Doge and I'm just waiting for an Elon tweet and I'll sell. 
Um, XRP, it did very well for me. There is a huge army. I don't really care about the token. But if they win that case with the support of the army that they have, I can see a very short-term spike on that one. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy in on that. And then XTP was that tap token uh, that I bought. And I'll be honest, I've actually already sold 80% of that token now because I've remembered that it's a short term, it's a shit coin. And I bought more dot, more glimmer, more near with it. So, you know, I'm building up um, those portfolios with me. So I, I made 11x, well, probably about average, about 8x by the time I sold the rest of it. On that, I'm absolutely happy. And I've been able to buy dot and, uh, and glimmer and near with that. So great. And I don't care that I bought them at the prices that they're at today and yesterday when I bought them. And then I got some of the AI ones, which we bought recently. But again, I've sold 75% of those and I'm just holding the dregs. And this is what worries me. This is where my problem was. Is I kept on holding on to dregs. Before you knew it, I had 90 tokens. So I need to tidy this up. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it yet. I kind of need to keep my Swiss Borg because that gives me cheap on and off ramp fees. I'm going to keep my Doge. So I probably need to be a bit disciplined with what I'm doing with these. Uh, I probably should have sold after the last one. I don't know. But that's all about portfolio management you know we i am starting to build my portfolio and i need to have an understanding in my head of what i want to do going into it and this season full season whenever it is i don't want to be having i don't even want more than 15 tokens i'll be honest if i want under 15 tokens the vast majority of them are going to be on either decentralized exchanges which i know how to use and i'm happy to use or centralized exchanges with a lot of liquidity i want to be able to move in and out of these very quickly um, and they're just some of the rules that I'm setting. Now, I think it was Tim mentioned Siam used to just pick the top two of every sector and go with it. There's, well, there's, there's tens of sectors. You might end up with 30 tokens there. You've no idea if they're any good. Plus the top two, what are the chances that they're the ones that are going to make the massive gains? And this is where I want to talk about how the number of assets and tokens you have is going to be different from everybody else. It's okay if you're carrying seven figures or six figures in your portfolio size you might be able to spread your um your allocation across a significant amount of tokens because you can still buy an awful lot of those tokens but you've got to remember you know whatever your portfolio size is it's still out of a hundred percent you know and if you only have let's for easy math say you have ten thousand dollars that's that's the size of your portfolio that's a lot for some people uh, and you can do a lot of damage with that but if you still decide that you're going to go into 20 or 30 tokens, you're only going to be able to buy 500 to you know, three to five hundred dollars worth of every token that you buy. Well, is it really going to um, get you know a 10, 15 x on what it is that you're buying? Potentially not. So then you have to look at the smaller cap ones, and the risk of those succeeding are far greater. And and so you 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 find yourself in a position where. You've spread yourself too thin and you're not going to make the big gains to move in. So, so to move on to the next level. And when I say next level, I mean the size of your portfolio. Whereas, um, I'll give you Dot as an example. So Dot, I mean, look at the Dot chart. Right? This is on the three-day time frame, okay? I mean, it's pretty much flatlined down here, hasn't it? Where, oh, where was it? I drew something. Yeah, I, I thought I'd draw something. But it's, you know. There's the top, right at the peak of the parachains launching. And then since then, it's just absolutely melted, capitulated down. And let's face it, since June, it's pretty much ranged in this area from under $8 to around about $4. So, you know, I've just decided who really cares if I'm buying at $6 when I can see what the upside of it is going to be. But if we try and draw, you know, good old fashioned uh, Fibonacci extensions from top to bottom, Okay, so let's let's say that dot gets back to the the um, I was going to say one eight, but let's just say it gets back to the point five level, thirty dollars, because we can keep the easy math saying you've bought in at six. It's still a five x from where you are. So if you bought, I don't know, because you've got your ten thousand still, but you're only buying a limited amount of tokens, so you're only buying five. You've bought um, two thousand dollars worth, but you've five x that. You've got a nice healthy um ten thousand dollars you know you've already made your portfolio size back just on that one coin whereas if you would spread it across say 30 different tokens there's no guarantee that you're going to get that back there obviously there's no guarantee that, um that dot's going to get to 30 dollars. but i like to believe 
where it is, where it stands, and, and the following that it has, that we will at least see $30 again. Um, and so for those of you that do have smaller portfolios, I would really consider, I need to go back to it so I can't talk about it correctly. I would really consider limiting the amount of tokens that you have. And now then you've got to ask yourself, well, what is it that I'm wanting to get out of this? Because if you're trying to make as much money as possible. Yes, you still want to limit the amount of tokens you have, but you're going to, you know, if you buy Bitcoin, does that only ever see a 5X? You know, is Ethereum the play? Could, could Ethereum get to 15 grand in the next bull run? It's a potential 10X there. And so it's then a conversation you need to have with yourself about what it is that you're actually putting in there. So understanding how much you've got to play with, how you want to divide that up. And then from that, you can kind of work out where you want to try and balance that risk. And it is a case of getting those funds as allocated to, to tokens that, yes, you believe in it, but have as much potential upside that you can stomach the risk for that. Um, but then also the absolute huge thing is understanding that you need to take profit at some stage. And then, then it's a case of how we take profit. And over the coming months, I mean, I talked about it all last year when we were trading. And I'll, again, continue to talk about it. But taking profit is one of the hardest things to do. It's something that's very rarely spoken about because FOMO, and it's, uh, you know, oh, I could go higher. And that always, it still unnerves me sometimes. I have to give myself a bit of a talking to to decide to take profit because, you know, money in the bank or stable coins can be recycled. You know, that's what this note is. You can either put it in a in a, a side uh, wallet just to use on other projects that you find, or you can actually take it out to cash and treat yourself to something. Today, we're in crypto to try and make money, actual money, not not paper money. Of oh, well, my portfolios were four hundred thousand dollars now, the highest bull one, because I didn't bother taking any out. It's now only worth forty thousand. You know, we've got to learn to take that profit. And I, you know, if you are interested in any of the ways that I've explained and you want to have a bit of a better understanding about sort of how I did my pots in a bit more detail, I'm absolutely more than happy to have a chat about it. Um, again, I'm sorry that I'm focusing on the people with the smaller pot sizes. I think people who have a larger pot size, you probably, you know, you can employ the, exactly the same mechanism here, but you, you have an opportunity to have a, you know, I, I can take a punt on Doge just waiting on um, Elon to make a tweet because I've been in long enough and I have taken my very small portfolio from 2018 to where it currently is now. But that's just because I've been in the market for so long. And for those of you with smaller portfolios, you may not be building towards this bull run. You may be looking at for the bull run afterwards. And that might not be what you want to hear, but that might realistically be where you are if you want to get that life changing amount of money. So it's not where you're going to be in two years time. It's potentially where you're going to be in six years time. And I've been in crypto for six years and I can assure you it's flown by. Um, so my three best trades for the last bull run were DOT, XRP and ADA. Uh, and with DOT, I mean, again, zoomed out on DOT. You know, we are at the levels this thing was when it launched. You know, who cares right now if it's $4 or $6 or $3? It's still a hell of a climb. And I bought around about $5. I don't know where that level is. And I, I rode it all the way up here. And I watched it go all the way back down to $10. I watched it go to $50 and then back down to 10. I didn't take any profit on that first run up. Shut myself down here, held on to it. And I knew I had to take profit up here. And, and, and I did. Unfortunately, I moved it into the likes of Ohm and Da and Time. So it wasn't a roaring success. But um, Ada, again, a really successful uh, one for me. I, I think I bought this one at $0.06. Cents. And I sold it at three dollars or just under three dollars. So that was the biggest trade I've ever ever done successful from that one. Um, but again, you know, rolled it up to here, ignored it, came back down, felt that pit in my stomach. I knew I was gonna have to do something from it. Now Ada had a, a crazy run uh outside of the market. You know, this was actually in September rather than November twenty one. Um and then yeah, it, it felt like it probably couldn't have been three dollars it sold at unless this is how bad it was. It was around three dollars. I reckon it must be after it fell. Anyway, it doesn't matter. An XRP I don't have on here, but again, that was another one where it's 19 cents I bought from, and I think I sold it for about $1.20. So the reason I say that is at the time when I bought it, I had no idea where we were in the market. I had no idea if it was going to go lower. I just decided it, it felt right to, to start the buy-in because I wanted to get a portfolio back again, and that's exactly how I'm feeling now. I've had the big fall. 
and I'm feeling comfortable just edging in a little bit, you know, each week. I took a couple of weeks off because we were riding high against resistance on BTC. You know, after that rejection here, kind of felt like, you know what, we might be in a better position um, to start buying here. And I'm just conscious of where the time is and what it is, so I think I'll just leave that one um, where that is. But if anyone has any questions on that, they want to talk about it in a bit more detail, I'm more than happy to. Again, another one that I probably should update that video. Um, and the fact that, you know, I don't want anyone to YOLO into the Simone portfolio, as Sam used to call it, um, thinking that that's where Sam is currently sat now because he's not. Um, so I might just tidy this one up and yeah, just regurgitate what I just said now but in a five minute format. Okay. Um, Let's have a look. Uh, are you worried about Matic, but they laid off 20%. I saw they laid off 20% in that stat, and they, were his, they have been accused of being paid. I, 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 I stand by, I've said this a few times, I think that Matic randomly is overpriced for where it is in the market. Like It's done so well compared to everything else. You know, it's been in an uptick since June. Everything else has rolled over. So this feels like a an overdue correction. I thought this correction was going to happen in September. I, I was kind of thinking it would get down to 60 cents and it just went away. So this doesn't necessarily worry me. I want it to come down. Um, I'm, I am worried I might potentially miss the boat on it. So, yeah. Um, isn't there a strategy where you buy BTC first and then when it pumps? Yeah, so that's something you can do. And that's using the Bitcoin dominance chart. So what uh, what we're talking about there is... When the bull market starts, typically BTC is the first to pump. It's the first to run. Um, and so what you'll see is the BTC dominance will climb. Um, so buying BTC earlier, then as that dominance climbs, it's climbing against other value, the value of other altcoins. So that means that when you go to move into altcoins, you don't move in from BTC to dollars. You move straight from BTC to whatever altcoin it is, and you can get more bang for your buck that way. Then altcoins have a much faster and also longer run to them. So then they, they don't overtake the dominance of BTC, but the equilibrium swings the other way. The BTC dominance comes back down, uh, resulting in you being able to then swap your altcoins back to BTC at a lower value, getting even more BTC for your buck. And that is a very good way um, of doing it. You've got to have a completely different mindset. You're not necessarily, once you bought with your USD, you're not bothered about the price, the USD price. You're only bothered about the relationship it has with BTC. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good way of doing it. Uh, I'd say it's, it's, it's a bit condescending. It's condescending. It's probably for more experienced people in the, uh, in the market, only because it just is a different mindset and it can, you know, you've got to put all FUD aside. You're not worried about that. This is a chart that you focus on and, and you know, gas BTC, you're focused on these kind of charts. So, uh, last bull and BTC rally then if and alts. Yeah, that's it. Especially if alts get hammered by the SEC ruling. So there's still that in them. I wasn't really a believer in Simon's view that the next bull run will be dictated by regulation. However, I do think regulation will probably come in before the next bull run kicks off. Whether or not that causes the bull run, I, I'm still sat on the sideline. But that seems a clear narrative from the Americans at the moment. that They are going to try and get regulation under control. Uh, and their go-to stance at the moment from Gary Gensler is everything except for BTC is a security, prove it otherwise. Um, I'm going to put a comment in our group after this. Um, I'd love to hear why people don't think cryptos are securities, you know, why they don't satisfy the Howey test. Because when you look at the Howey test, a lot of them do seem to satisfy um, the requirements. Let's see if we can just find the four questions. So an investment of money. So in crypto, we do that. Common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the effort of others. Well, most of us don't run a lot of these uh, projects. So it seems to fall from that. I think BTC probably meets the first three and then falls apart on the third one. Whether or not you can argue that, you know, the reason BTC holds its value is because of the security of the network, which is undertaken by the miners, and whether or not that is effort done by others. I, I don't know. I, I, it's not for now, but I think that's a good question. I would love to hear. You hear all the time that, oh, I don't think it satisfies the Howey test and all that, but I've never actually seen a comprehensive argument as to why cryptos don't meet that, especially ones that 
launched you know, ICOs and IDOs back in 2018. You know, they were clearly fundraising for them to go off and build a product. So, yeah, um, that'll be an interesting one to, to see. A lot of people just say it's because, you know, crypto is a new thing. Well, if they, this is what they're going to use and it does satisfy it, then, you know, are we on a hiding for nothing? Then? Anyway, that's a bit, bit of doom and gloom that I wasn't expecting to talk about. So I want to move on and I'm going to talk about Bitcoin's price. And it's been moving a little bit today, but 28th of February, everyone, we seem to always time our uh, uh, Avenger calls for end of month days. So we'll have a look at where we are on the chart. And I promise I haven't manipulated these lines. Look at it. The important level on the chart is 23,000.3, 23,300. We were above that earlier on today. And for whatever reason, with two and a half hours ago, we have fallen below it, 23,160. Cannot seem to bake, break and close above that level. Interesting to see how the next couple of hours go, but this has turned into a bit of an indeci indecision candle. Long wicks either side, very small body. Hard to determine where it's going to go next. And so we, we can have a look at some historic data. Um, if we do have a look at the historic data, I'm just going to refresh this. Sorry. Oh, I need Mr. Sitter. I'll edit that out. Um, Right, so we've got February in the uh, top right hand corner. So we're just just about green um, this month. But if we look at the month of March, historically, it's not been a great month uh, for BTC. And this is commonly tied to uh, tax season in America in April. So people cash out to, to pay for that. And I'm, I'm not counting 2013 because they were just crazy. But we've only had one double digit positive month, uh, which was in 2021, which is high the bull run. And that was right up to the, you know, the, the run. Um, but you can see we had momentum building up to that one. So, you know, we had 27%, 43%, 47%, 15%, 37%, 30%. There was momentum going into that. We haven't had that momentum here. In fact, it's been quite the opposite. Um, we've had sort of, you know, we were okay, we had a green month in October. But since August, you know, negative, 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 negative. January had a very positive month, so potentially breaking of it. But this is, seems like a stalling. Regardless, I mean, unless there's a massive pump today, it really feels like this month has stalled. So whether or not we're going to see that positive momentum running into March, we've got a lot of financial news outside of cryptos uh, being announced in March, which will, I'm sure will play some impact on the, on the price. But historically, March has been a red month. So we probably need to... Um, back to where that is and what that's going to do and and we go back to this chart and I, you know if we lose a level or we break a level typically we see the next level the only time that didn't happen was here this i don't know if we need to draw a new line on the chart now there's a few too many of them so i i'd still then if this is where we close in the next two hours i i think whether or not it happens in march or in april we will look to now retest 20k um and whatever that brings with the rest of the altcoins that's that um Trying to close above it, then you know we, we may have the momentum to uh, to climb up to. I mean, twenty nine thousand. I think once we get above that twenty five thousand, I'll go down to a smaller chart in a moment. I think FOMO will really kick in, and I think we will uh, we will see uh, we'll see the gap between twenty five twenty six thousand up to twenty nine k eaten very quickly. Um, right. So let's have a look. Oh, I'll just see if there's any other questions. Uh, what are your thoughts on running an ETH BTC grid bot long short, depending on dominance? I would love to do that. I just don't know how to. So I'd have to see if speak to someone who does know how to do that, which I do know people that do, or I'd have to use one, either Bybit or Binance. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, that'd be a great one. It, it, I'd have to understand how the settings of it work, because if you're trying to time it from when generally it's going to go, you know, you're expecting Bitcoin to do that run first, then hopefully it's not relying on 50 50 balance of trades and it can it the bot is smart enough uh to continue the trading whichever direction it feels is the most prosperous uh, but you know those kind of things i would like to put an allocation on my portfolio my gambling pot as such into things like bots i know they're slow and steady but i've not had the best of luck with them so. okay um so let's have a look at bitcoin's price action and where we currently are um on the daily and this uh, to me doesn't necessarily look I mean, we'll put indicators and all sorts on this layer but the overall structure at the moment to me doesn't necessarily feel too bad 
we've got a clear bottoming pattern. We've had that huge rise up. We've retested that. Maybe not 50%. Another rise up. Retested it. But what, what have we really formed? So we've got a low, a high, a low, another high. We don't know what this is. Potentially another low. It now feels like, you know, we went from higher, uh, sorry, lower lows and lower highs all through last year. Now it feels like we've actually managed to reverse that and we're starting to build the sites of, of a potential change in the trend. And we can't rule that out. You know, we can't. I don't care who you are. That's still in the build. We've got a clear bottoming pattern. Whether or not you want to try and have the narrative in your head that the global macro financial economic picture will drive this price down. It hasn't so far. And so this is where the trend is currently taking us. Um, we've also got a fairly interesting, I mean, actually it's kind of breaking it today. Maybe it's going to break it today, but we are, if we are, we're on a very important trend line at the moment. Um, each time it's bounced back, it's found momentum to, to climb off that. So it'd be interesting to see how this closes and what that what that does with it. But historically, five or six times it has hit this trend line, it's bounced off it quite nicely. Uh, in terms of price action, you know, we, we do have a decent amount of price action in and around there. I, I mean, I'd probably pull this a bit lower actually, um, and just taking the bottoms and the closes of these a little bit. More so, maybe it wicks down and bounces back up. But again, there's some some ability and some momentum there. If we were to duplicate this one, if I can pull it. next level I'd be looking at would be around about 22k. Now I could keep on putting these down. 22k, it's got some history to it. Um, or you could just lower it just a little bit to try and take in this price action here. But we lose this trend line and lose this support, whether you want to have it there, oops, there or there. There really isn't much after that to that 20K level. Um, it's about 19 to 20K takes it down. I mean, it's a little bit bigger. Taking those bodies. You've got the psychological element of the 20K level. You've got a lot of activity opening and closing in around there. We battled with that quite hard October. We lost it through FTX. We didn't find much resistance pumping back through it in January. Um, Maybe we catch it there. That kind of ties in with what could happen if we lose this here. But I would then see the 20K level as a pretty decent level. And I, I, I now go to, you know, most of the major drops have been driven or happened in the round times of, I don't want to call them black swan events, but major news events, whether that be macro stuff like the wars um, or crypto related stuff like uh, terror and FTX, et cetera. And so it kind of feels like we still need a black swan to really drive us down to those new lows. And and that's, you know, that that's kind of feels like for the bears, what we kind of need to wait for is a black swan event. Uh, and I don't know if that's a, a relatively sensible trading strategy because uh, the whole point of black swan events is they're not predictable. Um, so, <laughs> excuse me. So, yeah, so from a, from a structure point of view, market structure point of view, I, I still think BTC is in a relatively healthy position. Still can pull back, um, and and those pullbacks may lead uh, lead to further further falls. But I think that to get the bigger falls that everyone's looking for, they're going to have to coincide with with news events. Now those news events could be the Fed's reaction to to interest rates. Um, you know, interest rates. The data has been starting to come in hot. Sticky inflation. Now we're potentially losing that disinflationary narrative. What is uh, Chairman Powell going to do at the end of March? when they announce his FOMC federal rates. Um, and that's when we'll have the conference afterwards to try and see what his wording is going to be. But, um, you know, all eyes on up. But that's still, you know, that's three, four weeks away. There's still plenty of opportunity for, for Bitcoin and, and for the markets to, to rally further and an opportunity for those that are in the market to potentially make some money. So, you know, try and get away from that that negative, um, negative mindset continuously. Uh, you know, being a perma bear is not healthy. So we talked about the there's the fifteen. So we've talked about golden crosses and death crosses. So we had the golden cross. 
um, on the daily, but then we on the weekly, we had um, we had the uh, the death cross, and and you can clearly see on the weekly here that price has tried to get above the two hundred and the fifty, and it's been battered down both times. And for me, this is a clear rejection from uh, those levels from the twenty five k level, um, and you know technically it didn't quite form. Zoom in really far, but it, it didn't form a high on the weekly. You can kind of see there's just a bit of air between it. So, from a macro position, you could still say that this is still in a downtrend. You know, it came back up, it just formed another lower high, and are we now going to continue with a lower low, much lower down? If that does happen, that, that's likely weeks away, um, if not months away. You know, from the bearish point of view, there was a clear rejection there. Def cost still technically in play. Um, and, and yeah, we'll have to just see where that one goes. Now, I could throw up divergences for looking at RSIs and MACDs and everything else. And, and there's kind of conflicting information. So I'm not going to bother whether you go on the weekly, the daily, three daily. There's bearish, there's bullish, there's hooded, there's hidden, there's standard. Um, so it's, it's just a bit of a mess, to be honest, at the moment. And so I'm not trying to determine. Uh, which way I want it to go. I'm just positioning myself to act with whichever way it goes. Uh, and as I go back to it, feel perfectly comfortable for me to just be slowly building portfolios. And I'm happy to do that. And I appreciate that 75% of the people who watch this probably will not be doing that because you're just waiting for either a new low or sub 20K, or some of you are probably just waiting for whenever Simon's going to go in and you're just going to follow him in. That's fine. You just got to have that. I don't know where I put it now. I've lost it. That plan, wherever it was, of what you're going to do. Um, okay, let's have a look at some others. Uh, I think most are going to be relatively the same. Let's get it down onto a lower time frame. Uh, so, so uh, you know, Ethereum still doing you know similar kind of you know rise up, fall back down, rise back up. It's not had as many drops and and. Um, um pullbacks as as BTC necessarily has. So, you know, we've got um we've got to bear that in mind. From a fundamental point of view, the Shanghai update will go fork will go live next month. We'll probably end up talking about that next week. Uh, so people can unstake those that have been staking it for two years and back when it was like eighty dollars, you know, is that gonna have a, a, a short term impact on the price? We don't necessarily know. Um but yeah, there's uh it's it's still looking relatively healthy even on the daily it's finding support on the 50 it's still above the two uh, uh 200 so I, I don't necessarily want to rule it out but you know likewise i can throw up the weeklies and you can see exactly the same pattern that we saw um on btc uh dot i mean dots you know actually looking to break down a little bit further than than the rest at the moment uh because it, it it was it just performed horribly last year so the 50 and the 200 are a lot further away from each other because prices have been really suppressed uh, by the 50. And we, you know, we've not closed below the 50 since since the beginning of January. And at the moment, we're, we're a decent way below that. So potential there that Dot may see uh, some further falling. Uh, and if it were to, um, I mean, I mean, at the moment, it's resting on the 382, isn't it? Uh, so that's the impulse wave all the way up. I mean, you could have done it just from this one. They'd been so close to each other. But uh, you can kind of see key levels. I mean, just under, you know, sorry, $5.90. Decent bit of price action there. Um, 618 level. Picking up where we were uh, in December at 5.30. And, and, you know, it'd be a dream to get it down sub-5 again. Um, but, yeah, close below that 50. And, it, you know, we might be an interesting story for Doc. Doesn't mean I'm going to unstake any of mine and sell it. I've got mine locked up for 28 days. There's no point in me doing that. Uh, Ada, I mean, actually, you know, BTC looking healthy. Ada, now, now not. This one closes there. Actually, it's a lower low. Is that a change in reversal here now? Um, is this a sentiment that might be growing because of the narrative that's going out about uh, altcoins and securities, etc.? I don't know, but certainly um ada's feeling it a bit here um areas that i'd really be looking at is is around about 30 cents you know we lose we close below this 
not much there to catch it. So 31 cents what we're looking at. BNB, I mean, it's, I just, yeah. Again, I feel like this is just an overvalued token. I, you know, why it was ever worth $600, I have no idea. Um, why does an exchange token need to be that much? I don't know. Um, it's not looking as healthy as any of the others. Um, we're, you know, we're not seeing that trend upwards of repeated lower lows, sorry, higher lows and higher highs. We're, in fact, actually what we've just seen is one and then it's just flopped over, but it's had a bit of a beating um, Binance has over the last few weeks and so not surprising there. And actually given what we've seen it's held up relatively well. Um, I think there's some sort of trend line there. And potentially, Potentially connecting those wicks down there. Getting squeezed. Maybe a big move is on the cards for that one. Doge. I mean, even with B Elon's actually tried to put one, tried to put this. Elon's commenting on Doge a couple of times in last week, and it's not really moved the price so much. And so maybe he is losing his impact on that. Maybe I need to move to Floki coin. Um I I mean, sorry, going back to Litecoin. Litecoin's still looking pretty healthy. I mean, we talked about that a while ago, being a precursor for the Bitcoin har harvening. Litecoin normally runs first. That's a good indicator. Um, but yeah, it's bounced off that 50 quite nicely. It's formed that higher uh, low just. Um, and then, yeah, we shall uh, see where it goes. Sadly, Leeds United lost. Give you a running update there. Um, and I suppose that's probably, uh, probably, I mean, I can go through you know, some others, but near, might, might potentially be in a bit of trouble um there if it wants to close below that really needs to keep the 217 level um, or we're going to form that that low in terms of i mean it's lost that support koboed off it and it's coming back down i think we could see falling and again there's not much there to catch it two dollars there's a little bit but really maybe 170 to 160 what, what you want to look at so so yes that's where i am um, Kind of sit with that. I'm going to quickly look through some of the uh, the comments, and then if that's it, then I think we'll call it a night at one hour forty. Uh, let's have a look. Um, Hong Kong proposed legislation seems strict as hell. Uh, is that in terms of their institutional one for allowing uh, crypto? Uh, well, uh, institutional investment in June. I've not really read into it. A6 regards all cryptos as securities, okay, including BTC. Okay, interesting. It's the end of the month. We could see a move by the market makers today to get the price to where they need to be before the candle closes. I mean, we don't really talk about market makers on the, on this call, but I'm really buying into the market maker narrative. Um, it just, yeah, it's just a lot of uh, evidence. I know people don't use high block. It's an expensive platform to use, but when you have a look at liquidation levels and, and price just moves them very nicely. In my fact, on BTC today, I, I put out, um, that there was a liquidation level at around about 23,600. And then the next one was 23,100 and 22,700. And today we just look, we just hit 23,600. I can't be bothered to get high block up. You'll just have to trust me. But there was like $600 million worth of liquid, liquidation levels there. There's a similar kind of level at 23,100, which we've just broken now. You know, so they, they took that out nicely and thought, right, I'm going to reverse it, come back around, taking that out. And there's a tasty level a bit further down, uh, about 22,700. So I agree. I think market makers, if, if you can understand, you can start to use uh, liquidation levels into your house, understand how market makers move, um, move the markets and the patterns that they typically use, use that in conjunction with your standard tier. I think you're in for a, um, a much better outlook. Um, they don't care about the price. They just care about where the bags of money currently are. That's it. So whether it goes up or down to them doesn't make an iota bit of difference. Daily is still technically bearish. We just had a rejection from the 20. Yeah, so um, you're right, Ryan. Um, hopefully I went over that and you didn't just put that then or you might have just missed it. But from the bearish side of things, there was a clear rejection at 25,000. Coinciding with the death cost and the weekly crosses and it didn't beat the August high. So technically that is... Uh, lower high that's formed. Yeah, the institution one in June. Yeah, seems more bearish than bullish fault. I, I mean, I'm I'm not sure if it's just um, BTC at the moment has been announced, or if it's a lot more than that. I, I need to probably have a look at it. When I read the article last week, it was BTC and Ethereum was potentially what's going to be the cards. 
okay um it's kind of it for me now uh thanks again everyone for tuning in and putting up my waffle for now and 40 minutes apologies if the tv in the background was a bit of a distraction i should have just had it off result simon is on holiday this week however i have been assured that he will be doing a trading pub at two o'clock on thursday so please look out for that um if you have any questions whether it be about glimmer whether it be about um portfolio allocation whether that is your own or what i'm particularly doing or what i've done in the past either hit me with, with a direct message drop me a message in discord i will do a video on glimmer i'm going to film that tomorrow and so i'm crap at editing so it might take me a couple of days but i'll get it out um and then if i'm in a zone i might redo the three pot one as well they'll only be five minutes each um but i will put all the information that i used and the notes that i used uh the glimmer token uh, in Discord chat, and we've had a record of three and three. The last three we talked about pumped hard. Maybe glimmer. Uh, there might be a glimmer of hope for glimmer. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a great night. Thanks for tuning in, and I will speak to you all soon. Thanks a lot. Now.